So last time we left off talking about vision. This was last Friday before break. There were only about five of you here, but uh, everyone else, hopefully we can catch up. Those of you who were here, let's work on a little bit of review. So if I'm looking at something, what is needed for me to see it? Suppose I'm, suppose I'm looking at, uh, let's use a flower today. Great, let's make it a happy flower. All right, so I'm looking at a flower. What do I need in order to see it? Eyes. Right. In the eyes. Uh, importantly, I need functional eyes. I need vision. I need eyes that work. Eyes that are capable of seeing. All right, what else do I need? Because I need, according to Anselm, I need four things. What else? Light. Light. Uh, which allows <coughs> or enables me to see. What else? Two more things. For me to see the, the flower? Yeah. In order for me to see this, what do I need? A flower? Yeah. I need the object. And it needs to be visible. Right. So it needs to actually be here for, in order for me to see it. All right, what else? One more thing. No obstructions. Right. So I need no obstructions. So something can't be preventing me from seeing it. And so I need all four of these things in order to see anything. And someone's going to point out that you need all four of these things with regard to any power that you have or any ability that you have or anything that you can do. So for vision, these are the four things we need to be able to see. In order to be able to will something, we need something analogous. So we need the ability to will. We need something worth willing. And we need something that allows for it, and we need something to not prevent it. Those two are a little less clear, and that's what we're going to try and figure out as we move forward. Uh, now, worth noting here, um, Anselm talks about which of these is properly called a power, and which of these is improperly called a power. What is the difference? What's the difference between saying something is called something properly, and saying something is called something improperly? And this goes back to our glossary of terms. Hey, so what's the difference between calling some, saying something is called something properly and saying something is called something improperly? You remember this? I'm not sure. What do you think? Let's go on, I guess. Put this aside. Okay. So when Anselm talks about, we say something is, uh, so he says, one of these is improperly called a power. The others are called a power properly. What does that mean? So one of these four is called a power improperly. So what does that mean? How about I give another example, see so if we can figure this out. So if I were to say that there is light in this room, or the room is light, I would be using that term properly. I'd be saying that it, the, there's light in the room. I would say that properly. Now, if I were to say that, this, that the color of this board is light, I'd be using it improperly. It's still true, but I'm not using the term properly in this really specific sense that Anselm's talking about. Yeah? Improper means the way you're using it can be addressed in multiple ways. Yeah, something like that, right? So it's not this philosophically precise usage of the term. So if I'm talking about light, I could mean a bunch of different things. Properly, light is talking about you know, the photons that are, that are going through some medium that are allowing us to see, right? They, they strike the optic nerves, et cetera. Right? That's what we mean by light. There are photons present or something like that if we want to use scientific terminology. 
We can also talk of things being light with respect to like the shade of the color, like the shade of a color. This is a light green as opposed to a dark green. We're still using the term correctly, right? That still makes sense. It's not like I'm just speaking nonsense. It's not even just like I'm using, using the term in a weird, atypical way. I'm using it in a way that makes perfect sense. We all know what it's talking about, but it's not the philosophically proper definition. Yes, come on. Let's pay attention. So, so this is important because, well, first of all, one of these is not properly called a power while the other ones are. Which one is improperly called a power? Mm -hmm. Which one? Yeah, why? Why is this one not properly speaking a power? True, but neither is this. So that can't be it. So now note, it's not something you can control, right? So it's not your power to see. Right? This is the only one that you can control. This is a power of the object. The object is capable of being seen. It's visible. This is the power of light. Light allows for you to see. This is the power of, well, a third party, right? So for example, this book is capable of not obstructing your view of the flower, right? Because it's currently doing that. So if I do this, it is now obstructing it. What does the book need to do in order to not obstruct your vision? It needs to not be there, right? So if I do that, it is exercising that power, right? Guys, can we focus on class? If you're, gonna, if you're doing other work, you can do it somewhere else. All right. All right. So right now, the book is not doing anything. It's not exercising a power in the proper sense of the term but it is not obstructing your view. Another thing that's capable of not obstructing your view in the broadest sense is the air in front of it, because right? you can see through it. But that seems odd to say that, that the air is capable of not obstructing, right? It has this power because, well, it doesn't seem like it could obstruct your view. So this is only a power sort of analogically, right? We can only say this kind of metaphorically that this is the capability of something. What we're really talking about is the ability of something to prevent you from seeing. Or by analogy, if we're talking about the will, the ability of something to prevent you from willing something. Okay. Moving on a little bit. Here we have, um, we're talking about here the question of whether you have the power of preserving rectitude. In other words, if you have the power of continuing to will something good if you already will it, even if you don't already will it. Yeah, it's weird. Let's go with another analogy, and let's go with the, the vision analogy. So if you cover your eyes, are you capable of seeing? Yeah. Why? Why do you say yes? You're not using you closed eyes, you just covered your eyes. Yeah, right? So if I cover my eyes, maybe I can't see this, right? I can't see the flower, but I'm still capable of seeing, right? In this case, I'm seeing the palm of my hand, right? Even if I close my eyes, I'm in some sense capable of seeing, I'm just seeing my eyelids, right? My power of vision is still there. The power of vision, right? This, this part, is still fully operational. There's nothing wrong with this if I cover or close my eyes, if something gets in the way, or if I turn the lights off, or if I erase the flower. Right? I'm still capable of seeing this, even if something else is preventing it, even if something else is not allowing me to do so. So by analogy, the will is capable of willing something, 
even if it's being prevented from willing that thing, either by itself or by something else. The will can, the will is, is capable of willing something in the, in the most basic sense, even if it can't actually do so. Let's clarify this a little bit more. Do you remember what are the, what are the three aspects of the will or the three things we might mean by the will? Yeah, so, so that's, that's the most fundamental, right? So the ability, uh, or he also calls it the faculty. The ability or the faculty to choose something good. Okay, what else? There's two other things we could mean. Or there's two other parts to this. So when I say I will something, what else could I mean? Right, so that's, that's more or less the ability, right? I'm capable of it. What else though? And what? Hope, Close. But, I mean, you might be able to call it hope, right? But yeah, what? Are you talking about the instrument affection and exercise? Yeah, so the ability, a faculty, or another one he uses, instrument. Yeah. <laughs> Right? This is the same as when he talks about the instrument. And then the hope for something, or the desire for something, or the affection for something. And so I'm just going to go with affection. Uh, or we can say the desire, or even the hope for something. Right? That the will is inclined to something. Right? It wants something. Right? To say that I... To say that I uh, will to drink my coffee is to say that I want to. What else is it saying? If I will to drink coffee, what, what else could be happening? What else, is, what else are we talking about? I well, I can, right? That's this, that's the ability, right? I'm capable of lifting it to my mouth and taking a sip. I will it, in other words, I have the affection for it, I have the desire, I have the hope, I have the, uh, the inclination. What else? Yeah, the exercise. Yeah. Or we can say the doing, or choosing. So when I, when I will to take a drink of coffee, there's a few things happening. I have the ability to drink the coffee, or at least the ability to choose to do so. I also have the affection for it, right? I want to, and then I do. All of these can be talked about in terms of willing something. So this, analogous to vision, the ability to see, is like the instrument or the faculty. This is our capacity for doing something. The object is the thing willed, right? The, the thing that you want, the thing that you, that you do, that you choose to do. So these have to be something sort of in between your power of willing, in between you and the thing that you will. So it's something that gets you there. So this light, in one sense, it's the affection. It's what allows you not only to have the power of doing something, but it allows you to exercise it on a particular object. And it's always, it's always going to be a, an affection towards the object, just like light is illuminating the flower on the board. Right. And it's the power of will, so let's, so let's go with the instrument of will. It's inclining the will towards something. <coughs> okay. But if you don't have that, if you don't have the affection for something, if you don't want something, there's a sense in which you can will it. But there's also a sense in which you can't. How do we make that distinction? Between 
if you don't want something, in what sense can you will it? And in what sense, what sense can you not? In what sense is it impossible? Wait, is affection an object or light? Oh, uh, it's light. I just, it's, yeah, let me, that's confusing. The affection is inclined towards an object. The object is the thing that you will, or the thing that you want, or the action that you choose. So what's the In what sense is it possible to will something that you have no affection for? And in what sense is it impossible to will something that you have no affection for? By analogy, in what sense is it possible to see something if there's no light? And in what sense is it impossible to see something if there's no light? Well, you got to kind of mean a little bit. You, you have to mean something a little bit different by it. More importantly, I think you need to you need to ha mean something a little bit different by um, by being able to or being capable of. Here's an example, uh, and this is an example using will. All right, so imagine you are selecting a dessert. Let's say after Thanksgiving dinner. Thanksgiving dinner. Um, you have the choice between, um, for dessert after dinner, you have the choice between uh, chocolate cake, uh, pecan pie, uh, and a steaming pile of dog shit. How many of you are going to choose the chocolate cake? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you are going to choose the pecan pie? Raise your hand. Really? Okay. Well, a couple people. Good enough. How many of you are going to choose the steaming pile of dog shit? Why? Because why? Because I don't like cake or pie. Okay. Okay. What are you going to do with it? I don't got to eat it. I'm not going to. That's true. You can just kind of leave it there. Fair enough. Why leave the dog? The, why leave the dog shit there and not just leave the slice of pie there for someone else to eat or the I cake? Get a slice of, uh, I don't want the slice of pie or the pecan pie okay. or the cake. All right. So you can just kind of say, "Oh, no, thanks." <laughs> So, okay, so first of all, no thank you is an option here, right? So I, I don't want to discount that, at least for now. We, we might want to remove no thank you as an option later once we start talking about what Anselm talks about in Chapter 5. But for now, that's an option. You can just say, uh, no thanks, that's okay. Given that option, would you still choose to have the plate of... Okay, I didn't think so. <laughs> So I think we could say fairly that none of us in here have the affection for a steaming pile of dog shit for dessert, right? Fair to say? Right, that's a perfectly reasonable response. But we have the ability to choose it as demonstrated. Thank you. I was hoping someone would say that. We have the ability, right? We can choose it. There's nothing preventing us from choosing it. There's no obstruction. There is an object. We just have no affection for it and would have no reason to have an affection for it. Oh, come on. It'll come back. That's fine. So in what sense are we capable of choosing it and in what sense are we not capable of choosing it? Right? So you're always capable in general. You still have the faculty or you have the instrument that can choose it. So you can. You can choose to order a pile of dog shit for dessert after Thanksgiving. You can go in the backyard and scoop it up after the dog had his leftovers. That's fine. But why is it, why is it that no one is going to choose that? I don't get how that changes the capability. It doesn't, in one sense. You're still capable of choosing it. The difference is you never will. Right? Because you have no affection for that choice, so you're not going to exercise it. So the point here is if you're missing part of this faculty of willing, right? if you still don't have the, if you don't have the affection for something, you still have the ability 
you can still choose it so in the abstract. Does not, um, affect will? It doesn't affect that part of will. It does affect your choices. So it affects that. It affects your will in that sense. But we have to be careful what we mean by will because because Ansel means a few different things by it. Right. Yeah. So if you don't have the affection for something, you're not going to choose it. However, you still can. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of affection to will. There are not. Kind of. And it, I mean, it really depends on what you're talking about for impossibility. If by impossible you just mean it'll never happen, then yeah, it is impossible. If you mean that you're incapable of choosing it, it's never impossible. And that's a really important distinction, especially for this next question, because right here we move on to asking whether temptation compels the will to sin. In other words, are we caused to do wrong by some temptation? Is the, is the desirability of, of something wrong, is that what causes us to sin, or is it always a choice? It's still a choice, even if we seem like we're compelled. So to illustrate this, he has an example here about lying. In particular, lying to save one's life. So we can, we can elaborate on the scenario a little bit. Uh, so first of all, he says, no one abandons rectitude of the will except by willing to do so. Therefore, if against, one, uh, against one's will means unwillingly, no one abandons rectitude against his will. In other words, we still will something, even if we might ordinarily, in a kind of imprecise, improper way, say that it's against one's will. It's still willing, at least in an important sense. So the example he brings up is you know, lying to save one's life. So we can imagine a scenario like this. So uh, suppose someone is out to get you. Someone's out to kill you. And... Right, they are you know, asking, asking around, uh, are you this person I'm after? Are you this person I'm after? And they get to you and they ask, are you your name? They obviously are intent on killing whoever you are. They're actually intent on killing you. But you, you have reason to think that if you say, oh no, I'm, that's not me, they'll believe you and move on. He's also assuming here, which we can just assume for the sake of argument, that lying is always wrong. Right? So maybe it isn't, maybe it is, we can set that issue aside, we can just go with his assumption that it's always wrong to lie. The question then is, if you say no, for my example, no, I'm not Vincent McCoy, that's, that's somebody else, and the murderer believes me and moves on, did I lie willingly or unwillingly? then why would we still say, well, I lied because I had no choice? I did, could have chosen to get murdered. <laughs> I could have chosen to be murdered. Yeah, that's true. Ansel wants to put some nuance on this. Because we say that. We say that kind of thing all the time. I didn't have a choice. Right? It, it, especially if we're coming up with an excuse for something that we ordinarily would say is wrong, we would want to say, if we want to you know, not be blamed for it, we want to say, well, I didn't have a choice. I had to. Oh, right. Wouldn't you think it's a greater wrong to tell the truth in that situation? Basically, you make a suicide. You allow somebody to kill you. Now, there is a difference between allowing someone to kill you and committing suicide. That's true. But Anselm is perfectly fine here assuming that allowing yourself to be killed, especially for a frivolous reason, is wrong. Right, we can, we can admit that. We can just go full bore for that. Right? So he's going to say, yeah, okay, yeah, lying, that's wrong. Uh, allowing yourself to be killed for frivolous reasons, that's wrong too. So there's a problem. If they're both yeah. wrong, then you really didn't have a choice in choosing something wrong. You had a choice which one to choose, but either, but both things are going to be wrong. What? Yeah, so say that, ag oh, so say that again. Okay. Because this, this is what Anselm winds up saying. So go ahead. You say, I didn't have a choice because you did have a choice. It's just that both options were wrong. Right. Oh. Yeah. So, it's something like this. But, so does that mean that there's one which is more wrong than the other? Maybe. That's relative. 
Well, maybe not. Maybe it's not. Maybe that there can still be an objective answer to that, right? That's true. So, so you did something objectively wrong. Right. So the alternative is worse. That's why you didn't have a choice, right? Maybe. You didn't have a choice in the one sense, right? He wants to draw out this distinction. So let me scroll this down a little bit. There. And this is right, right here. So right at the top of this. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, I'll read it out. Talking about the person who lies in order to save his life. He certainly lies against his will because it is against his will that he must either lie or be killed. That is, it is against his will that, it, that he is in this difficulty or in this situation. So that of necessity, one of these two possibilities must come about. So the whole predicament <coughs> is wrong in general? I don't know if I would say it's wrong, but it is against his will to be in that predicament. Right. And that it's a predicament that forces a wrong answer. Let me give an analogy. Or, well, another example that you've probably heard of. Um, does this look familiar? Um, let me, there. Oh, wait. There we go. You've all heard of the trolley problem. This is, this is where uh, you happen across a runaway trolley. There are five people trapped on, its, on the track that it's going down. You find a switch. You know that if you flip this switch, you can divert it to another track, and it'll only kill one person who's trapped on a different track. Do you flip the switch, killing one person, or do you leave it alone, allowing five to die? Good question. That's important. Um, for the sake of argument, we usually just assume that all of these are innocent strangers. Kill one person. Okay, so you actively kill someone. That sounds like murder. In that sounds wrong. Inactively killing five or actively killing one. Well, you're not actively killing five. You said inactively. I said inactively. That's true. You save five people if you flip the switch, but you actively kill somebody. Yeah. You did something. Yeah, you did something that, that killed someone. Now, the other way, you don't act. You don't, you don't make yourself morally culpable. But at the same time, you could have prevented the deaths of five people and you chose not to. You're responsible for their deaths. You've done something wrong. I yeah. If you don't flip the switch, you're going to have more guilt because you know you could have done something. But then again, you just actively killed one person. But yeah. you could have saved three. You could have saved four. You could have saved five. It's true. Right? So I'm going to have to run over five people. Yeah. Right over one. No, because if you switch, if you do the switch thing, then you're you know what you're doing. You're intentionally killing someone. Yeah. You so here's a. Option, all right. Here, no, here we go. Let's let's change the scenario a little bit. And this is a common common change to this. So <laughs> let me um, I can get rid of this. So if instead of oh, actually, you know what? I can just search for it. I'll I'll just find it. So instead of, uh, instead of switching the track, um, oh god, that's not right. That is. There we go. This is a really common ethical dilemma. Um, <laughs> so instead of being able to switch the track, suppose you're above the track and there is a very large person next to you. And you know that if you push the large person onto the track, he will be brutally killed stopping the train and it won't kill the other five people. What? Do you no. push him onto the track? No, no. we're going to get I'm all not. five people are getting run over. Well, wait a minute. You said that you would kill somebody to save five. But in this case, would you That's have different. time to try and save as many people? Well, not if the, no, that's, that's a, not if it's a runaway trolley and you can just go shove. But a trolley still that's won't murder. stop. That's He's murder. really big. That's murder. The it is. The situations are different. If How? you weren't there in the first scenario, mm -hmm. the truck would still have killed like this number of five people. Mm -hmm. Here you're actively pushing someone who nothing would have happened to if you had 
But if you weren't there in this one, it was still yeah. Five yeah, if you weren't here in this one, these five people still die. If you're not here in this one, then these five people still die. In this one, if you flip the switch, this guy dies. In this one, if you push him over, this guy dies. They're functionally identical. Yeah. So the point of this, now, in an ethics class, we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks on this and get nowhere. The reason we would get nowhere is something that Anselm points out, is that there are situations you can find yourself in in which there is no right answer. There's no right answer to a trolley problem. Getting yourself into a situation like this is a problem in itself. What we would say is that you are you are in the situation unwillingly. But the choice you make within the situation is still your choice. Right? And you're still responsible for it. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Because you made a choice. So what's going on here? What seems to be happening is that, well, we can, we can look at this in, um, to to clarify what's going on when we become enslaved to sin, as he says. Because we always have the ability to will something. We have the ability to will anything, right? In this minimal instrumental sense, right? We have the capacity to will anything. In the trolley problem, you can will that everyone survives. You can choose to save everyone. <coughs> you can't do it. You can't actually exercise that will. You can't accomplish it, but you can choose it. The problem is you have no capability of carrying it out. So that rules out the exercise. When you're limited in a situation, right, when you say, oh, I had no choice between lying and being killed, what happens is you don't have the affection for telling the truth in that case. Another affection is overpowering it. Your, your, your desire to stay alive. So what's going on here is that by removing your capacity for exercising a certain power and by removing your affections for certain choices, you're limiting your ability to choose in an important sense. You're putting yourself into a situation where the choices are limited. So how does this relate to enslaving one's will to sin or to doing wrong? Because we still have the abstract capability or the, the, the faculty for choosing the good. Right? We can still choose to do good. We just won't. Because we've put ourselves into a situation where we don't have the affection for choosing something good. We've limited our options. So what, what this means is, so if we've if we have preserved rectitude, to use his, to use his terms, right? we've preserved this, um, this inclination of the will towards good things, which is what he means really by, by rectitude. So if we have the affection for doing good in whatever circumstance, then we're capable of doing it, and we probably will. However, if we have abandoned rectitude, if what we've done is we've chosen to habituate ourselves into doing wrong things, into choosing, into making the wrong choice, what we've done is we've gotten rid of the affection. So, in that sense, we have the instrument for choosing the good. We're still capable of choosing the good, but we won't. And in an important sense, we can't. Just like you can't choose a pile of dog shit for dessert. Right? Now you can in some really abstract sense, right? You could, you could choose to order it, maybe just to spite me. Just to prove, yeah, I can, and I'll eat it too, and I'll enjoy every second of it. And it'll be awful. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because you're still making a choice. You're still exercising your, your faculty of will. You're exercising the instrument 
for something that you have an inclination for and have actively chosen. Yeah, we'll get there. He hasn't offered a solution yet, but he has one, yeah. Is the uh, exercise part that, uh, compared to the no obstructions? Um, the exercise is more like looking, directing your eyes. Um, so it's like a, it's a separate thing from the, the four? Yeah, so the four, um, let me write these back up here, because that is a good question. So we've got vision, or actually, let me just put these in abstract terms. So we have the the faculty, uh, we have uh, the what allows, we have the object, uh, and we have no obstructions. All right. So the faculty is obviously the faculty or the instrument, right? It's the ability capable of choosing regardless of whether there's something that allows it, whether there's something that obstructs it, or whether there's an object. Yeah? In these cases, we still have the choice to not do anything, right? But it, it, it yeah. seems like it's still wrong to not do anything. Well, in the trolley problem case, y y yeah. And that's why I said, well, wait a minute. Because, yeah, you can choose just not to order dessert if none of the options seem appealing. But if, if you know, a runaway trolley is hurtling down the tracks and you choose to do nothing, you're, you're allowing something bad to happen that you could have prevented. You can also choose to not say anything. They ask for your name and they let the mother ask for your name. That's true. You can choose not to lie. But I think he's assuming here that if you don't lie, they're going to assume that, oh, you must be the person I'm here to kill. Right, it's still wrong. It's wrong in a sense, at least, yeah, right? Because you're still allowing yourself to be killed. And it's a sin, like according to In a sense, it's not ideal, because again, that's what he means by a sin, right? Sin isn't necessarily like violation of some abstract ethical norm. Sin here, he just means imperfection, doing something that is non-optimal. I think I mentioned this early on when we were looking at what he's talking about. Right? Something, because to not sin for Anselm and how he's talking about this is to do the right thing. And to do the right thing is to do the best thing possible. Because remember, think back to early on in the course. Anselm is the one who defined God as that in which nothing greater can be thought. He thinks really strongly in terms of maximal perfection. So maximal perfection in terms of exercising the will is just exercising the will in the best way possible. Uh-huh. And for example, in the case of the matter, you do have a worse wrong, for mm -hmm. lack of better words. So if you do choose to lie and say a name, you're not sinning? So how Anselm would So assuming that lying is always wrong. How he winds up deciding is that, yeah, you've chosen to lie. He doesn't really consider the other option in, t in the same terms. Right? So we can. Right? We can look at it. Uh, allowing yourself to be killed, that's, that's wrong in some sense. Now there you can say, okay, well, which one is more wrong? And so you can say that, okay, well, the best choice is to lie and not allow yourself to be killed because allowing yourself to be killed is worse. Maybe. But remember, that's not the best possible option. Because the best possible option comes down to what you're capable of willing, not what you have an affection for, not what circumstances you're in. So, the best possible option is to not get into that situation in the first place. If there's anything that you could have done to avoid that situation, whether you knew it or not, that would, be, that would have been the right choice. That would have been avoiding sin, is not getting yourself into this situation in the first place. Why this matters isn't about any particular situation that you put yourself in. Why he's talking about this is because in terms of uh, enslaving one's will to sin, right? in terms of eliminating affections for the good, we do put ourselves into that situation by choosing lesser goods. 
Right? Rather than choosing to do, the, to do the best thing possible, what we wind up doing is we choose to do wrong. And in choosing to do wrong, we eliminate the affection for higher goods. And so we make ourselves incapable of choosing those higher goods. We eliminate the affection. But even by, after we've eliminated the affection, we don't have the affection for the highest good, the best possible option. We can't choose it in that sense. We can't exercise that will. We still have the capability of doing so in the most minimal sense. And so we're still responsible for choosing otherwise, even in situations where we would, we would have no desire to do the right thing. So we've caught ourselves in this trap. And we've put ourselves in a no-win situation. And that's what Anselm is really pointing to in this fifth chapter. Because it's not, remember, the, the question here in this chapter is whether temptation compels you to sin against your will. In one sense, kind of. Because temptation is, is an affection that you have. So that, that leads you to exercise it. But at the same time, you have the capacity to do otherwise, even if you would never exercise it, even if you don't have the affection for exercising it, even if you don't want to. You have, there's nothing about it that compels you to. It's still, in that sense, your will, right, in this sense, in the instrumental sense, it's still your will that chooses it, that chooses to do something wrong, even if you don't have the affection for anything better even if you've put yourself into the circumstance of being only realistically capable of choosing wrong options. So in this sense, it still comes back to the will enslaving itself. All right. Is that clear enough? Clear enough? No? All right. Well, we can come back to it next time. It's not control over your options. You're going to rub it that's being controlled. Sure you can. Yeah. I mean, here's one. If I spill my coffee, can I still drink it? No. I could lick the floor. Yes. But am I going to? Under any circumstance, am I going to lick the floor if I spill my coffee? You can choose to. I can, but will I? Uh, if that was the last bit of caffeine in the world. Probably not. I'm not that addicted. I would, just have, I would just have splitting headaches for like a few weeks. I do have a problem, but it's a little problem. It's okay. Um, <laughs> but really, I, right, I would, I don't have the affection, for, uh, I don't have the affection or the desire to lick coffee off the floor. So I never would. Even if I'm abstractly capable of doing so, I could choose it. Oh, yeah. If I had the desire, then the question disappears, right? <laughs> So then I, I, then I just would have the desire and I would choose it. We're talking about when you restrict yourself from certain options. Right? I've restricted myself from the option of licking caffeine off the floor. Right? If it were dropping an ice cream cone and I were one and a half, I, ha I wouldn't have restricted my options yet. So then it's control of options. Sure you do. You can choose to. You can choose to lick it off the floor or not. We're in slips to... All right, we're going to have to pick this up next time because we are out of time, unfortunately. But this is, this is, this is great. We'll pick this up. But yeah.